There are a couple of African leaders who have given passionate speeches regarding one issue or another, but there is one who outshines them all, and that is Nelson Mandela, who delivered one of the most famous speeches of the 20th century. Nelson Mandela inspired people from all walks of life from all over the world. Not make a mistake in identifying him as one of the greatest um, of those who were prisoners of conscience. This speech titled, I am prepared to die, shook not just Africa, but the whole world. And it set the stage for putting an end to apartheid. I have cherished the ideal of a free society. It is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. A political system that upheld segregation against non-white citizens of South Africa. But it all began in 1948, after the National Party gained power in South Africa and its all-white government immediately began enforcing existing policies of racial segregation. Even before 1948, segregation between whites and blacks was already rampant. But 1948 saw the government make this segregation, also called apartheid, a state law. You intensify your present policy of racial segregation. The uh, policy of, uh, what do you mean by intensify? Whether any further measures are to come, uh, it's impossible for me to say at the moment. I do not know of any. The goal of the government at the time was to separate South Africa's white minority from its non-white majority and to divide black South Africans along tribal lines in order to decrease their political power. There's a lot of prejudice against us. You know, the magistrates were white, the prosecutors were white, the police were white, and uh, most of the time, practically all the time, of course, we appeared for, for blacks. By 1950, the government had banned marriages between whites and people of other races and prohibited sexual relations between black and white South Africans. Black South Africans were required to carry identification with them at all times. They needed to enter areas designated for whites, and they were removed from the voter rolls and eventually fully disenfranchised. In addition, a Registration Act was passed into law in 1950 that classified all South Africans by race, including Bantus, who were the black Africans, colored, which were those who had mixed race, and of course, the whites. These laws after 1948 had one purpose in mind, and that was to ensure that the four million whites in South Africa had uh, all the resources, the wealth, the jobs, the mines uh, concentrated in their hands. This legislation sometimes led to a separation among families, with a parent classified as white while their children were classified as colored. The government also passed a series of land acts into law, which gave more than 80% of the country's land to the white minority. And in order to limit contact between the races, the government established separate public facilities for whites and non-whites, limited the activity of non-white labor unions, and denied non-white participation in national government. In 1958, Hendrik Verwoerd became the prime minister of South Africa, and he decided to refine the apartheid system into what he called a separate development. Perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness, accepting that there are differences between people. Under this so-called development, the South African government established the Promotion of Bantu Self-Government Act of 1959, which created 10 Bantu homelands. The purpose of this legislation was to separate black South Africans from each other and enable the government to claim that there was no black majority, thereby reducing the possibility that black people would unify into one nationalist organization. But that was not all. In one of the most inhumane and devastating aspects of apartheid, the government forcibly removed black South Africans from rural areas designated as white to their homelands and sold their land at low prices to white farmers. According to the reports, more than 3.5 million people were forcibly removed from their homes and deposited in the Bantustans, where they were plunged into poverty and hopelessness from 1961 to 1994. Meanwhile, while all this was going on, the international community watched on without doing anything to stop this gross human rights abuse. However, in South Africa, people began to stand up and mount opposition and resistance to this system. Prominent among them was Nelson Mandela, who started South Africa's first law firm and was a member of a group that agitated for the civil rights of black South Africans known as the African National Congress. We put our foot down and insisted in being respected, even though we're prisoners. You have a limited time to stay. Africans require one the franchise on the basis of one man, one vote, they want political independence. At first, Mandela and his fellow activists used nonviolent tactics like strikes and demonstrations to protest apartheid. For instance, in 1952, 
They encourage black South Africans to actively violate the law by burning their identification pass, refusing to carry it, or violating curfews. This resulted in the arrest of more than 8,000 people, including Mandela. This defiance campaign carried out by Mandela and his crew catapulted the ANC's agenda and Mandela into the public eye as they continued to agitate for black rights. You must fight the battle for dignity mm -hmm. on the very first day you go to jail. Really? And uh, that's what we did. We put our foot down and insisted in being respected, even though we're prisoners. And we eventually succeeded in that. After serving his sentence, Mandela continued to lead protests against the government. And in 1956, he, along with 155 others, was tried for treason. At the time Mandela was serving his prison sentence in 1960, the police opened fire on a group of unarmed black people associated with the Pan-African Congress. We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. That it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks. PAC, an offshoot of the ANC in the black township of Sharpville. The group arrived at the police station without passes, inviting arrest as an act of resistance. But instead of just arresting them, the police opened fire leading to the death of at least 67 people and more than 180 people sustained injury. After Mandela was acquitted in 1961, he and the other resistance leaders were convinced that armed resistance and not peaceful ones was the only way to end apartheid. So in 1962, Mandela left the country to receive military training and gain support for the cause. Unfortunately, he was arrested and convicted soon after his return for leaving the country without a permit. And while in prison, the police discovered documents related to Mandela's plan for guerrilla warfare, and so he and his allies were charged with sabotage. It was this third arrest that led to what is now called the Rivonia trial, which changed South Africa forever. I hated oppression. And when I think about the past, the type of things they did, I feel angry. You have a limited time to stay on Earth. You must try and use that period for the purpose of transforming your country into what you desire it to be. Mandela and his fellow defendants, Walter Sisulu, Govan Mbeki, and seven other anti-apartheid activists were certain that they would be convicted and most likely executed. So they decided to go out blazing, turning the trial into a statement, publicizing their anti-apartheid struggle and challenging the legal system that oppressed black South Africans. The Rivonia trial kicked off in October, 1963. Prior to this time, Mandela was serving a five-year sentence on Robben Island after his conviction in the 1962 trial. So, after the incriminating documents gathered by the police, which charged him and his fellow activists with sabotage, Mandela was flown to Pretoria to take his place as accused number one. In Mandela's autobiography, he revealed that they had no plan of defending themselves against the charges levied against them. Instead, the plan was to use the trial not as a test of the law, but as a platform for our beliefs. He said, we were not concerned with getting off or lessening our punishment, but with making the trial strengthen the cause for which we were struggling, at whatever cost to ourselves. To achieve this, the accused and their lawyers decided that Mandela would open the defense case, not as a witness, but with a statement from the doc. This format would allow him to speak uninterrupted, but it carried less legal weight. According to Mandela, he spent a fortnight drafting his speech, working mainly from his prison cell in the evening, and then the D-Day arrived, and Mandela marched to the dock in a traditional Josa attire to lead his own defense. My Lord, I am the first accused, Mandela said. I admit immediately that I was one of the persons who helped to form Umkanto We Sizwi, and that I played a prominent role in its affairs until I was arrested in August 1962, he continued. Mandela went on to speak for the next 176 minutes. According to Martha Evans, author of Speeches That Shaped South Africa, Mandela candidly confessed some of the crimes leveled against him. I have refused to be drawn into the differences that exist between various communities inside the USA. <clears throat> you have not commented that I am going to offend anybody by refusing to involve myself in the internal affairs of the USA, <clears throat> of the USA. Releasing political prisoners 
allowing uh, exiles to return, uh, withdrawing uh, the army from the locations, and uh, generally creating conditions for free political activity in the country. Those are the demands. Before giving a cogent and detailed account of the conditions and events that had led to the establishment of MK and the adoption of the armed struggle, he spoke at length of the ANC's tradition of nonviolence and explained why he had planned sabotage. Okay that the suggestion made by the state in its opening that the struggle in South Africa is under the influence of foreigners of communists is wholly incorrect. I do not, however, deny that I planned sabotage. I did not plan it in a spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love of violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation, and oppression of my people by the whites. Africans want to just share in the whole of South Africa. But above all, we want equal political rights. Because without them, our disabilities will be permanent. I know this sounds revolutionary to the whites in this country, because the majority of the voters will be Africans. This makes the white man fear democracy. I have cherished the ideal of the democratic. I didn't plan it in a spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love for violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation, and oppression of my people by the whites, he said. The final section of the speech addressed inequality in South Africa and humanized black South Africans in ways that Mandela argued the country's white population rarely acknowledged. Whites tend to regard Africans as a separate breed. They do not look upon them as people with families of their own. They do not realize that we have emotions, that we fall in love like white people do, that we want to be with our wives and children like white people want to be with theirs, that we want to earn money, enough money to support our families properly. And above all, my Lord, we want equal political rights because without them, our disabilities will be permanent. I know this sounds revolutionary to the whites in this country because the majority of voters will be Africans. This makes the white man fear democracy, but this fear can not be allowed to stand in the way of the only solution which will guarantee racial harmony and freedom for all. Interestingly, author Nadine Gordemar, who was present at the trial, said that Mandela's delivery of the speech was very disappointing. Us who were against apartheid and wanted to see the struggle succeed against it, um, it, was, we, it came from in ourselves and from our life experience, but we were led by Mandela and his thinking, yes. My heavily involved friends in the African National Congress and in other uh, organizations against uh, who fought in the, in the struggle against apartheid, that they didn't expect me to write propaganda. They simply accepted that uh, a writer um, who is by nature a writer must go deeper resistant and boring. However, she said that it was at the end of the speech that he came through. All the while Mandela was speaking, Judge Quintus DeWitt managed not to look at him, but as Mandela was about to deliver his final lines, defense lawyer Joel Joffe remembered that Mandela paused for a long time and looked at the judge right in the eye and said, The idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea for which I hope to live for. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. After, after Mandela spoke that sensational and goosebumping line, Nadine Gordimer noted that the strangest and most moving sound she had ever heard from human throats came from the black side of the court audience. It was short, sharp, and terrible, something between a sigh and a groan. This was because there was a very good chance that Mandela and his co-accused would be sentenced to death for their opposition to the apartheid government. In fact, Mandela's lawyers had actually tried to talk him out of including the I am prepared to die line because they thought it might be seen as a provocation. But as Mandela later wrote in his autobiography, I felt we were likely to hang no matter what we said, so we might as well say what we truly believe. Mandela's speech garnered attention and support, not just from South Africa, but also from the international community. The pressure most likely caused 
caused the judge not to give a death sentence, but Mandela was sentenced to life in prison, where he was allowed only one 30-minute visit with a single person every year and could send and receive two letters a year. Once the Rivonia trial ended and Mandela got his sentence, it seemed like Mandela was forgotten. According to a source, the apartheid government seemed totally in control. The resistance was dead. It was a thoroughly grim period for the ANC. However, everything changed in 1973 with the Durban strikes and the revival of the trade union movement. The rebirth of the black trade union movement signaled the beginning of a new phase of opposition politics. Things ratcheted up several notches on June 16, 1976, when apartheid policemen opened fire on a peaceful protest of school children in the black township of Soweto, killing 15 people. In the eight months that followed, violence spread across South Africa, killing about 700 people. During this period, Mandela was given chances to leave prison in exchange for ensuring the ANC would give up violence, but he refused. After the Soweto uprising, foreign investors fled South Africa in their droves, laying bare the fundamental flaws of the apartheid government's dependence on cheap labor and mining and its point-blank refusal to meaningfully educate people of color. By the 1980s, even the apartheid government could see something had to change, and in 1983, Prime Minister P.W. Botha announced plans to include multiracial and Indian South African, but not black South Africans, in a new tricameral parliament. However, his plans backfired spectacularly, as it united the opposition like never before under the newly formed United Democratic Front, UDF. And one of the UDF's key demands was the unconditional release of all political prisoners, especially Mandela. By the mid-1980s, free Nelson Mandela became a constant and global refrain with the I am prepared to die statement being quoted at rallies and emblazoned on t-shirts. Eventually, on February 11, 1990, Mandela was released from prison after more than 27 years in prison. From the balcony of Cape Town City Hall, he addressed his supporters for the first time since Rivonia, saying, I stand here before you, not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. Your tireless and heroic sacrifices have made it possible for me to be here today. I, therefore, place the remaining years of my life in your hands. He ended by quoting the final lines of his 1964 statement from the doc, explaining that they are true today as they were then. Over the course of the next decade, as Mandela first navigated the treacherous path to democracy and then served as the country's first democratically elected president, he lived out his vision of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. Although he was considered by some analysts a largely ineffective president and was criticized for his handling of violence and the economy, while in office, it does not change the fact that his passion and commitment did a fantastic job in removing apartheid as a system of government in South Africa. Every year on July 18th, he is remembered on Nelson Mandela International Day, a United Nations holiday that commemorates his service and sacrifice. And it is a reminder that Mandela's work is not yet done, an opinion shared by Mandela himself. As he said, the true test of our devotion to freedom is just beginning. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video.